but I will only tell my favorite ones. <laughs> it's at Paris Capital of Arts and the Visual World of French Theory, Volume 1 and Volume 2. I had Volume 1. Volume 2 is in French now. Yes, yes. Great, but that's the one, I mean, both volumes, that I would like to translate for our Sonata Attack publications into Turkish. Isn't this wonderful? It's a dream. It's a quite wonderful book. I <laughs> <laughs> We like. We are hard workers. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, ceremonies. <laughs> And I wanted to say uh, for Turkey that I met your president, the president of Ayika, Turkey, uh, on October the 4th, indeed very little time ago, in Berlin. Uh, and he actually stood on the platform uh, before the Turkish speaker, who was going to give the paper, and, um, and announced to the international public that he was making a plea on behalf of Osman Kavala, who yeah. I believe is still in prison. So I wanted to acknowledge that. And it was exciting for me to meet him and think that there was that Turkish presence before we met again. And also I'd like to acknowledge Charla Osbeck, who's my former student, and so and my new one, I don't know who is going to be inspired to work on on uh, these sources. And so really it was Icicle's idea that I should give you a talk linked to my book because she might want to translate it or get someone to help translate it. Just to say the second volume is not to do with this subject, which is all very filmic, very, very much to do with questions of realism. It's called Photography, Body, Material, Concept. It involves women, thank God, because this is my first volume. My definition was a very boisy volume about Lieta writing a monoe, Baudrillard writing, well not Baudrillard, but Bourdieu writing on, it was all men. Yeah. And this book will have, she begins with Sheila Hicks, written on by Lenny Strauss. It's got Julie Kristeva writing on Jackson Pollock. It's got Yita writing on Ruth Franklin. So it's got women in it, it's got the Holocaust in it, it's got photography in it. It's going to be uh, a nice change. But uh, the interesting thing is that I thought a long time ago that it was a very good idea for marketing purposes and to hit the intellectual jackpot to call my book The Visual World of French Theory. Visual World of French Theory. But actually, um, many French theory people really couldn't care less. And I thought retrospectively it would have been far more sensible if I or, 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 or far more good publicity, and maybe in Turkish you can, we can have a new preface that we can call it, yes. if I'd actually I call it, it New Wave Realism. Mm. Because also, everybody in French faculties, as you know, is obsessed with New Wave, that's all they know about. They don't know about um, painting at the time, or art at the time. And the interesting thing is that the Pompidou Center in 2009 actually staged an exhibition in Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou yeah. um, of these artists in conjunction with their own films and film and called it New Waves. So they actually made that move and they did something with a very actually unintellectual catalog, but lots of film and lots of images. Now, I've just written a very small kind of obituary appreciation of one of the artists of this group, an artist not so much written about in my book, although present in my book. And it's, it's interesting that many people, if you're at all interested in contemporary art and know about contemporary Chinese art, many of these artists, to do with French diplomacy, very active as well in Turkey, mm -hmm. many of these artists showed in China in the mid-1980s, before 1989. And I think they had a big influence on things like the Star Group and the Chinese realism we saw even yesterday in our cafe, there was that smiley face guy. Mm. So just to say that this is topical and so forth. And the fact is that I'm going to show at least one or two or three of the artists who are in my book who actually had a filmmaking or video making practice and this is this whole dimension of the filmic dimension of their realism because of the game of my book, which was about when big philosopher met this artist, how did it change the philosophers thinking about language and thought. Because of the what the French call the enjeu, the actual game strategy of my book, I wasn't able to actually underline 
this film thing. So to begin with, I want to show you the film. It was indeed shown by the Pompidou in um, China by Jacques Monnery, my dear Jacques Monnery, the first artist I met who was written about by um, Lietar. And this was actually in a kind of film booth opposite one of his works with a slice of mirror in it, uh, both at the Pompidou and stage like that in China. But it's a fabulous, a very emotional film. And it's when, we can begin with X, is when Jacques Monnery went to Cuba as a participant in the great Cuban mural painting, which was like the world thingy of left intellectuals against Montreal Expo 67, and made this incredible film called X, which we will fast forward to Godard at the beginning of my speech. But I want you to enjoy it first, because it's really rather amazing, and it's very, very short, with very little narrative. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were going to the bottom. <laughs> so, it's just called EX, which of course can mean all sorts of things. Exit out, my girlfriend. <laughs> So the point is that the, I don't know whether that went to go away. Ah! Sorry. Enter full screen. I think, no, oh, slide change. Maybe this one. This little thing because it's very irritating. You need to go full screen instead of slide change. Okay, okay just let's go in because it's going to do it for all of them. View full screen. Well, it's not true. Ah, so, isn't there a Mac expert here? This is so irritating. <laughs> but why don't, it, why don't we do a um, slideshow? Oh, just do everything. Okay. So, and that's one of the So, the thing is that, of course, it's also very emotional, but the thing that's very interesting is that you saw the artist himself, Jacques Monnery, kind of collapse and die behind his. That is an absolutely direct and deliberate quote from Godard's A bout de souffle, or Breathless, in which, in which Monnery himself, the artist, is actually imitating uh, the uh, hero of Godard's film, Jean-Paul Belmondo, uh, which is itself a take on Humphrey Bogart. Just to say, of course, we're not talking about American film and French artists, we're talking about the French film noir, and the French film noir is a way in which the 
French intellectuals were fascinated by Hollywood B films, the worst kind of really corny films, and their very understandable tropes that they subjected to structural or psychoanalytic analysis or whatever. So do you see it was the kind of B film Hollywood thing that then Godard himself would take to make a very highly quotational film that Monomy himself is taking up and using in this film. This is um, a, one of my favorite and, uh, photos, I mean, paintings by him called For All That We See or Seem as a Dream Within a Dream. And this is surprising because when I first encountered Monomi and discovered the link with the philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard, there was this incredible romantic, uh, we say now bromance, you know, romance between men going on between the two of them, which was based on romantic tropes and romantic heroes, not only on, in this case, uh, the idea of Edgar Allan Poe coming up, who was very popular in France, but this idea that um, Lyotard was going to play the Manet to, um, to uh, Monori playing, Lyotard was going to play the Baudelaire to Monori playing the Manet, okay? So in 1998, I invented this title for my essay, putting the two of them together and editing Lyotard's text called Postmodern Romantics. And this idea of a postmodern romanticism which went with everyone at the time having long hair and bell bottoms and things, was long before the phrase romantic conceptualism, which we now study as a, bro a kind of later, more emotional side of conceptual art, which was only named as such in a very Germanic way by the critic Jörg Heiser, who um, writes for Fries Berlin and so forth. He only had his exhibition called Romantic Conceptualism in, 19, in 2009, oh, that famous year, the year of our meeting. So this is a kind of postmodern romanticism, uh, well, not avant la lettre, but avant, avant your Kaiser's lettre. Uh, and the point is that this romanticism I described in my introduction, there's a funny problem about realism at the time. If you use the word realism in France at the time, there were always the spectres of, so, of French socialist realism uh, in line with Stalinist social realism, which people wanted to evacuate. And on, <clears throat> on the other hand, um, there was American hyper-realism coming in, first shown uh, in Paris in 1971, December 71 at the Paris Biennale. Um, and also, there was a retrospective of Courbet, which preceded in 19, I think, um, I'm just forgetting, in 77 itself, this very funny year, the retrospective exhibition of Courbet, the great realist with the great left-wing manifesto, preceded the retrospective of which the Pompidou Centre opened, of Duchamp. So you had a Courbet exhibition and a Duchamp exhibition. In fact, it's Courbet after Duchamp. I think it was one about two months later. So you had Duchamp before Courbet. So these artists are filmic and post-Duchampian, <coughs> melancholic, and yet obsessed with America, or in this case, Cuba. And if you look at another piece by Monori, where he is um, making a portfolio of prints, and he's always dressing himself up with a cowboy hat and a gun and so forth. This is one of his boxes. You have, of course, not only the idea of Duchamp's box, but a collision with James Bond's secret briefcase. This is actually based on um, a, a late surrealist called Rodansky, his book called Victory Under the Shadow of Wings. But you can see it's set in Hawaii, and it's a kind of po it's like surrealism meets James Bond is the plot. The shooting of the suitcase has got a map where the bullet holes have gone through the map. So you have all these different layers, uh, and yet Monovy's work is always blue because as a child, he was driven to open air cinema projected in black and white, where people put a blue filter on for um, night and a yellow filter on for day. So his first bluing of everything, which obviously also goes with the concept of blues in jazz, as you heard in the film, the bluing is also a kind of avant la lettre cinematic uh, situation before he goes forward. So that's very interesting. Now, of course, at the same time, the divine Jean-Luc Godard, whom, as you all know, however pretentious you may think he is, 
was very much a French intellectual among French intellectuals and conceived of himself as such, and was very much a figure within the whole intellectual cahier du cinéma movement, was, of course, interested very much in the visual arts, which entered in various ways his own creativity. So this is a very reciprocal relationship. Um, here is uh, two stills from Pierre Le Fou, which is early, when there's obviously a parody on sort of cutting up film strips and things going on. It's very self-conscious sort of his work. But there is Picasso's Girl with a Mirror, 1935 MoMA, behind our heroine, who one presumes, as she's in her dressing gown, has just made passionate love but is about to kill somebody. And here is Godard actually painting the face of Pierre Blue. You all know, if you know the film, how it fits into the plot. People often make um, um, analogies with the painting of Nicolas de Stahl. But this idea of painting and physically painting and the cineast painting is part of this reciprocity that I think is so interesting. Now, the other guy who's on the scene as part of this triangulation I want to make in this lecture is the philosopher Louis Althusser. Now, if you think of wonderful, wonderful Paris, post-war Paris, with these incredibly powerful philosophical figures and writers that I found so fascinating for a lot of my career, like Jean Paul Sartre, and then kind of displacing the existential moment of Roland Barthes, Everything is, is stuck with this thing of you know, great male philosophers. And Althusser is able to break this by being very charismatic, extremely productive himself, very important and very translated into Turkish, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> and of course, he cunningly, and not cunningly, and I can't remember the actual date relationship between Althusser and Thomas Kuhn, who wrote his book on paradigm change, but Althusser invented the term rupture epistemologique, epistemological break, to mark the kind of change of epochs and thought epistemes um, in his own work. And of course, his big thing was after the disgrace of the French Communist Party in terms of the death of Stalin in 1953, the um, 20th Party Congre Congress in which Khrushchev denounces Stalin's crimes in 56, and of course the party didn't know how to respond. He's able, with his chums like Etienne Balibar, Macheret, and now Jacques Rancière, who was a participant at the time, actually produce this thing of rereading Marx straight without the mediation of all the communist stuff and its dreadful language in poor Marx and the other capital. This is 65 it comes out. But by 68, the great moment of revolution, which obviously almost really happened, um, you've got pocket size, Lire le Capital, and everyone is talking about the young Marx, and they're able to go back to the source at the same time as Jacques Lacan is saying, go back to the original Freud. So well, when Althusser is saying, reread Marx, um, <coughs> Lacan is saying, reread Freud, and actually, Althusser takes up psychoanalysis, gives Lacan a job at the École Supérieure. Sorry, I should quote French quickly, but gives uh, um, Althusser a job in his own very prestigious um, institution. And so it's this very, very, very interesting moment. Now, what happens is that artists, after 1968, when they were on the street, need to take the words of Althusser and the whole scenario of what this means, this epistemological rupture, as it were, rupture epistemologique, this epistemological break means for art into the museum. And of course there were curators like someone probably also translated into Turkish at the time, the communist critic Pierre Godibert, who were actually going to Althusser's lecture and taking his photocopied notes back to the artists. And in the basement at the uh, school of, uh, in the Musée de la Ville de Paris, the artists were not just like doing their own thing in their studios, but having artist meetings about which um, manifesto type works they could produce as a group after democratic, um, democratic votes on what the subject matter would be, for example. In those notes, it's all published later in 72, um, uh, uh, Godibert introduces them to Althusser's idea of the ideological state apparatus, again a term some of you may be familiar with, um, different in French of course. And in 1969 you have the first really militant salon after 68 called Police and Culture, 
in which they are making group works like this one, which relates to these um, dominating state apparatus sculpt, uh, structures. And this one, I'm sorry there's only a weedy black and white photo that remains, is called school book, class book. Are you go to school and you're indoctrinated into the class system. There's a pun on classroom and, and, Early and class. Yeah, and this one you can see here again, and you can see that they're using the technique of what was very com popular in France, the BD, the uh, bande dessinée or comic strip, uh, and they're probably big tourning to use that situationist word, people like the content. They're using photography, comic, they're saying um, instrument of propaganda and certain the service of the bourgeoisie and so on and so forth. These are not very beautiful works of art. They demand another type of response and obviously this exhibition didn't last very long. But it was just, but, and Althusser actually visited it and did a radio interview in it, but the radio interview was mysteriously lost. However, in that same exhibition was the work which um, I wasn't able to reproduce in my first edition because um, one of the artists was sitting on it waiting for somebody more famous like Bernard Henri Levy to lend it to the exhibition called The Adventures of Philosophy, in which ah, it suddenly appeared when it was in his house in Madrid all the time. And this was also in Police and Culture, and it was called the Dacha, which is, a, a, as many of you know, it's the word for a Soviet place in the country. But all the old theory guys have been locked up and sent off to the country, which is what the Soviet Union did with undesirables and or, in this case, the ideas. You needn't take that. I can send you all the PowerPoint. Um, people who are irrelevant. And the idea was that this is a parody of a salon painting. It's history painting size. It looks like a very bad oil painting with this very deliberate gold frame. The idea is you're looking through glass, and Althusser himself, who's like the more or less goodie for the young people, is mysteriously poised on the threshold. He hasn't quite been locked up in this dacha, which is called Sad Honey. It's a pun on the titles of Levi Strauss's books. You see Foucault there, the little doggy, and you see the pansy, which is a reference to Levi Strauss's book, La Pensée Sauvage, Savage Thought, and you see Barthes and so forth, and Lacan standing up with his little bow tie, and uh, the you know, Eskimo mask. Uh, but this is a, and, but of course, one thing that's very important, and I'm sure some of you, um, some of the older people in the audience must have been to Paris and participated in certain discussions there. There's this idea of painting being all able to be dérisoire. This is a kind of bad realism, where the actual bad realism, this isn't filmic realism, this is bad realism, which is deliberate. It's derisory realism. So that was in police and culture, too. But then our guys get on to trying to make painting extremely relevant. And I'm beginning with uh, the artist Bernard Ranciac, who was the artist who was written about uh, almost first of all, because he was sick and tired of the, of the kind of art waffle, the Aika France art waffle going on. And what he wanted was something harder and more political that would deconstruct things. And after a certain success based on using comic strips, um, he was taunted in a newspaper saying, you know, why aren't you doing something more politically relevant, mate? And he produced this exhibition called 19, the year 1966, in which he just based everything on what was in Illustration, for example. And looking at everything, remember Althusser had invented this idea of symptomatic reading. Looking at things not formally, and not even sociologically, but as symptoms of a wider situation. So this is in fact the first is the first moment of a photographer actually suing, uh, long before day Jeff Koons and things, a photographer suing an artist for taking his image. Because this is the moment of Andre Maro's World um, Black Art Fair in Dakar in 66. And this is called, um, in Paris, Rue Jacob, when the exhibition moved to the Grand Palais, the dinner of the headhunters, the collector headhunters. So you have the same problem of rich collectors, of course, and they're all doing this rather obscene thing, putting African masks over their head. And what Ranciac did was actually parody the painting in acrylic, but the painting could open to show the off the scene 
implied by the symptomatic reading, which is obscene. And the obscene is that behind this really grotesque gesture are the faces of the great black liberationists, Patrice Lumbaba, Franz Fanon, who wrote White Skin, Black Masks. Yes, I do it always the wrong way around. And Malcolm X, who was a great hero of the time. So this idea of what is off-scene and obscene is like the political black and white reality. And he did other works like Malcolm X here. When Bourdieu, Bourdieu wrote about him, he wrote about the fact that there, there was a bevue, it's a very funny French word, B-E-Acute-V-U-E, a kind of misvisioning that where the photographer allows more to be seen than the photographer himself thinks he's looking at when he takes the picture. I won't go any further than that. It's a complicated but short text. So Rancière also uh, was involved with Maoism. He actually turned from his previous communist convictions, like many of the intellectuals at the time, to Mao. This work is actually in Lisbon. And what's funny here is that this, which shows a very interesting change in palette too, to these flat quasi-Chinese colors, is based on this um, ballet of the Red Brigades, which is hilarious, I mean, this idea of um, Maoist ballet dancing, uh, which was performed for Nixon in China, and then performed at the Paris Opera House, but also turned into a film that was projected. And he's done this diptych in which you get the press response to the performance, and you can see, it, they love these on their beam, you can see the tree there with the people prancing around. But here is Mao's actual um, diktat on socialist realism of 1942, just cut up and stuck on the canvas. So that's quite interesting, taking you off into a kind of thing where you have socialist realism involved, obviously not socialist realism, a thing, a thing. And then this is Ero, who also is working at the period of Maoism. He's not a Maoist. He's getting painters from Thailand to displace one of the most popular figures in the most reproduced, uh, um, <clears throat> the most reproduced image of Mao at the time, multiplied by 900 million in China. This image of Mao, and sticking him in other uh, funny places all over the world. But at the time, and like other members of the new new figuration uh, move, it wasn't exactly a group with a manifesto. The new figuration tendency. He was making film, and he was making parodic, you can use that word again, derisoire, derisory film. And here you see Ero, kind of semi in drag, uh, making himself up for this funny film, Sahara, Sahara Holiday, with Valerio Adami and his uh, brother Giancarlo in this particular film. So just to say there was a kind of coterminous practice, and of course, talking of Maoism, even before. Uh, the great moment of 1968, Godard is on the centre. I love the incredible colour composition. You can see how very pictorial Godard's eye is in this brilliant shot, uh, brilliant still from the La Chinoise, which, as you probably know, is a funny parody of these young people locked up on holiday, mouthing Maoist whatnots. Um, but if we look at the poster for La Chinoise, you can see there's something very interesting, and it's interesting even as a political comment on the reality of revolution being bloody, at the top of the poster. This is 1967. Where does this idea come from? This idea actually comes from another painter I'm going to talk about who collaborated with um, Godard the year before, Gérard Fromanger, and this is the poster for his own exhibition in 1966, the year before. Now, what is interesting here is, and this is his painting at the time, which was actually a piece of a hardboard. It was like a game on the idea of painting called My Painting is Dripping. Obviously not dripping. But he gets together with Godard and creates a series of so-called film tracts, which are a precursor to video. In 1968, as you know, the École des Beaux-Arts Sorry, I keep saying that. The School of Fine Arts. The School of Fine Arts started up this huge lithography studio and produced 800,000 posters and with 800 designs. One of the only posters after they brought silkscreen printing in from from America, because before they did it with lithography, it was much much slower. The, one of the only posters they refused to distribute. 
And this was also one of these things where they all sat and discussed whose poster was, was going to go ahead. It was Fromager's poster, which was like this. Because they thought the idea of the French tricolor running with blood was really too much. So it was banned, but Danny Cohn Bendit actually spirited the design away, made 20,000, which were never distributed because then he was forced to leave the country. However, what happened was they got together and Godard said to Comrade, can you just tell me how you did that? And he said, sure, and showed him how to kind of tip the canvas and pour the red paint on and let it trickle. And he said, well, hey, here's a film camera, which he was doing to other people at the time. And they, and they actually went around making film tracks together for nearly a year, um, including in London, which is another story. But this is very interesting. And then the other uh, kind of a silkscreen production that Franger was making was based on the work of a photographer who at the time was not given the prestige that we give photographers now, but was like his chum, the photographer, who went out with him, took photos of people on the street. This is, you can see people actually um, having demos, but there's a lot of sweeping up after the demos going on here. One of Franger's idea is that every man is every demonstrator on the street and everybody in the crowd, but they were all united by the red. It's kind of a very political thing. This actually won a huge international prize, beating Warhol and Jasper Johns in Tokyo in 1970 because it was so powerful and the image of France was so powerful. And this, this multiple image, these multiple images of photography based silk screen actually became uh, part of another video he made with Godard uh, ca called Rouge Again Red, uh, but slightly more complex than the, very, than the first one. Now to move to a different film by Godard, Alpha Veal, if you remember it at all, it's, it's extremely miserabilis, it's very miserable and melancholic. It's a vision of the future that is uh, based on a very eerie presentation of the present. Now this cool uh, and kind of glum scene bleeds evidently into Fromager's first exhibition, in fact prefaced by Gilles Deleuze, called The Painter and the Model. This brings me to a very, very amazing, I feel, had to dig it out, I can tell you, a very amazing, illuminating quote, I think, by Gilles Deleuze. Because when, apparently, even when he was very young, he was interested in cinema and um, talked about cin cinema and so forth. But um, he said, because people said, well, how do you apply your very complex philosophy to cinema? He said, it's not a question of applying philosophy to cinema. He said, one went straight from philosophy to the cinema, and inversely, one went straight from the cinema to philosophy. And if you think of their practice at the time, the students, you know, in, uh, in Saint Michel, this is precisely what people were doing. So you could intellectually separate the categories if you wanted to, but on the brain, which you'd already described as a screen, everything was kind of coming together. I think it's a really interesting quotation about the contiguity of these complementary practices. And so he is the person who comes to Fromager. When Fromager is in, in, in this kind of alphaville, different mode, he calls this series, um, this whole series is based on the idea of different colors. And I'll show you how he paints, because Fromager, amazingly enough, paints in a very cinematic setup. Remember that wonderful word, untranslatable word, what is it? Can't even remember now. The, uh, the word that means apparatus or setup in French. And what he does is he paints in the dark by projecting photos, and then he um, doesn't just draw around the figures. He begins with white and goes back from white highlights in a very, very deconstructed way to saturated color. There's always the authorial presence of the artist here, and it took me years before I suddenly had this great epiphany that of course doing it myself, if you stand in front of the screen, mm -hmm. you get your shadow projected onto the screen. Even even Foucault also writing about it, never, never had a hit on this. But so there's not only that, there's the idea of the scene of painting being part of the scene of the painting. 
in this, uh, always these distancing devices, but this is very long after the kind of uh, nouveau roman linked to nouveau realism. I'm sorry, I should have said that, but it's different to explain. You can see here as well, though, he's looking at a shop window. The preface about him begins with the idea of merchandise and the model as merchandise, as something to the transaction. You can see that he's also looking through glass. And if you flip back to Alphaville, you see that a lot of it is painted through glass again. It's a very funny idea of invisible barriers and distancing, which actually gives you some access to the painting. Now, of course, at this time, as I said, in 1971 at the Paris Biennale, you have, before the next year, the Castle Documenta for art historians, you have the twin presence of American hyperrealism and conceptual art. But if straight American hyperrealism, Richard Estes, is all about commodities, and it is all about looking through glass. But it hasn't got the kind of the desire plus the melancholy. Uh, that you get in Fromanger. So here you're just looking through glass at commodities in some jolly, you know, Midwestern town. But this was part of the thing as well. Of if you go back to Fromanger and are hotter, because Deleuze's preface is called hot and cold. And as we were talking about people not mentioning their sources today, you were talking about because Bourio not yes. mentioning Donna Haraway. Exactly. In exactly the same way, these big guys, Deleuze does not mention Marshall McEwen's book, Hot and Cold, of course, mm -hmm. let alone understanding the Egypt, because they all want to be perceived to be brilliant, which of course they are. So you've got a lot of desire going on here. And you see as well the way that the, the silhouette of the, of the um, hero, the protagonist, is actually forming part of the um, poster for Alpha Bill too. So back to this, and you see how he's going through in an almost a mechanical way this scenario of color, <coughs> merchandise, self-referentiality. But in the last of the series, we have again this idea of the mise en abîme, where he is looking through glass at his work in the gallery, in which he's looking through glass and so on and so forth. So you can see these guys were, you can say the realism element is very simple because they're copying things and filling things in. And I'll show you another very interesting work in a second. But you see this way in which this um, self-consciousness and self-referentiality and the very overt reference to film is important. Now, Fongerger is one of the people who was lucky enough to go to China with a filmmaker who was making a film all the way through the visit, uh, Joris Claude Evans, the Belgian communist filmmaker, making a film about Mao moving mountains. I, I talk about this in different terms later on. This was brought by the Pompidou Center right at the very beginning, incidentally, and then never shown until now. <coughs> but at the same time, he was painting, he was meeting amateur peasant painters in one of these kind of show, show towns. And when Foucault writes about Gerard Fromanger, Michel Foucault, the uh, um, essay called Photogenic Painting, now well known, but my story is I found this in what's called a Pradri, where they were selling off old catalogs. I couldn't believe that Foucault had written about this guy. He talked about the kind of whizzing, he called it the slingshot of images, linking up a tiny village in China with Paris, for example, <coughs> and the humility of the painter versus the extravagance of Paris and this, that, and the other. 74. Now, by 1975, it's extraordinary what had happened to Foucault's predictions because, first of all, there was an exhibition of peasant painting in China. I mean, there was an exhibition of peasant painting in the Musée de la Ville de Paris, the actual museum which had had the police and culture thing in 69. And we see in Godard's film how trendy these Chinese peasant paintings are. There were outlets selling them all over Paris. It's where Aaron bought his things to copy. And you see, um, and also the peasant painters themselves were invited to the salon in autumn. So Foucault's idea of this kind of worldwide, he says he talks about it is in his preface, the first teletragedy planetaire, the first planetary teletragedy, which linked the whole world, was when Kennedy was shot. And so after that, that idea that the tiniest person in the tiniest village is linked to us by media was really important. So I just put that in so you see this business about peasant painting. There's old imperturbable Goddard. 
Um, I'm put blinded by my spectacles here, but I think I'm going now changing register. So the problem is with the French, I don't mean the problem with the French, but the delicious and poignant thing about these artists is that they're absolutely into cinema, and yet they're pulled back by the great tradition of painting all the time, of romantic painting, and the idea of the painter as revolutionary, like David. And amazingly enough, the very summer the Pompidou Center opens with Marcel Duchamp, one of the next shows in the Pompidou Center is this thing called Guillotine and Painting, which is to do with a French revolutionary painter and a restored canvas, Topino Lucas. Uh, and I won't go into it, but this is a story about suicide. It's like the suicide of painting as well, which of course is what's at stake with cinema, the end of painting. And this is what Fromanger does. He actually puts the painting up, up there and kind of with his everyman idea, says this is what's happening today on the street. But if you like, he's been pulled back by the power of painting to painting and not to cinema. So there's a very funny dialogue going on here, as you can see, between painting and cinema, even when you would think that this is just Duchamp time, you know, at the Pompidou. So it's very, very interesting. Uh, and of course, the idea of referring to these have been on the go in the socialist realist time. This is Poussin, and this is the Poussin, only recently rediscovered in color, done by the 16-year-old painter Fromanger as a socialist realist thing. I don't need to go on about this, but you see that there's a very great difference between the self-referentiality and the media savviness of the 70s generation versus this idea of transposing the old master into the present of the socialist realist generation. So this is the difference. This is amazing. This is um, in the same series, the Topino Lupin series, as well as the people on the streets. This is Fromanger's autobiographical self-representation. It's like a self-portrait of how he paints in his studio with all the press at the bottom, in the dark, with the screen, with the projected image from the epidioscope on the screen, do you see? And he's just fiddling around with his apparatus uh, about to paint. He's actually now just painted the first Christmas in this prison riot on the top. He met Foucault because he was part of the group called GIP, the Group of Information on Prisons, because at the time there was an incredible amount of police violence, people in prison, very bad political situation, and so it was Foucault the militant who interested the painter before Foucault the Foucault, the Foucault if you like. Uh, and then, of course, he goes on. This is really the moment when video, when film is giving way to video and uses that experience in, uh, again, a self referential video, not film, because the film tracks he did with Godot were small, small films, okay, uh, by 79. So this dialogue is very important. Now we flip back to Althusser, and the Althusser situation, I always thought was the most interesting chapter in my book, maybe not in terms of the cinema, but there is a very interesting story here as well. This is Althusser in 78, and Althusser is really initiated into painting by this communist critic Pierre Gaudibert. First of all, he writes on a surrealist, rather bad, um, Cuban surrealist, but his preface goes into the show in Cuba where Monopoly was. Secondly, he writes on this guy and does very, very tortured bodies, but in an old fashioned way. And most people who say Aldous's art criticism is rubbish only read the text on Cremonini. Then Gaudibert takes him to the Venice Biennale, the Venice Biennale with the American pavilion, Robert Rauschenberg of 1964. So you can imagine the philosophy being taken around by a very experienced. Critic, he sees things like the Amima Rotella, the idea of torn poster art, which is, if you like, breaking up the screen rather than doing dream painting. And finally, in he finally finds, if you like, his painter. The idea of philosophers having their painter, I think, is very interesting. It goes right back to the tradition of Paul Eloi with Picasso, Louis Aragon with Matisse, but now it's the philosophers with their painter. And the painter who is important for Louis Althusser is this, this is the most romantic picture of the most romantic artist in my book, Lucio Fanti. 
A member, Altista, had an Italian mistress and was very widely translated in Italy and spent a lot of time in Italy. And the Communist Party in Italy and the Communist art venues were in exchange with the Communist art venues in Paris. And bizarrely enough, um, this anticipates Moscow conceptualism, something that people now are very keen on, because Fanti's father was the communist critic for the Italian newspaper Paese Sera. And so every day, and so he was always going on freebie trips to the Soviet Union and bringing back brochures of the wonderful Soviet Union. But by the time, what's very interesting is Fanti's painting is always already tongue-in-cheek, as we say, with a pinch of salt, before this happens to Altusa. This is actually, someone pointed out to me, this is in Kiev. He had a brochure of the 500th anniversary of Kiev, and they could tell from this. So this is actually in Ukraine. As early as 1970, there was a great touring exhibition in which these very political works, with Lenin quotes under them, were in a huge art and politics exhibition that toured the whole of Germany, again based on a... But here, the message is not clear. This very famous sculpture of Merkurov has been kind of scored all over and is already infantilized with these school girls. And there's this sky, which means that something is a little bit nightmarish already. And by the time we get to after the publication in 73 and all through 74, the huge discussion about Solzhenitsyn, the Gulag Archipelago, and how could communists possibly stay in the Communist Party in this dreadful scene, you see that Fanti, who is using, again, previous paintings, this is um, off the cinema just for a second, is quoting very famous socialist paintings. This was shown in the Lenin, 70 was Lenin's 100th, ex, 100th anniversary exhibition, so he must have been born, 100th anniversary of his birth or something. He does these very, very sad, melancholic things in which the figure has gone. So what's interesting is that, um, I confirm, because all the biographers of Althusser think that everything he wrote autobiographically was after he was conquered and don't take it seriously, but I confirm that he actually went to the Soviet Union, Althusser, to a mathematics conference, and a Hegel conference, I mean, in 1974. And, and he also came in contact with the absurd state of the relationship between Soviet ideology and the life under Brezhnev, you know, the stagnation period. And he used to play truant from the Congress and run off with a Soviet Georgian philosopher, Mera Dishvili, to sort of explore this absurd. And what's interesting is the paintings he prefaces by Fanti, which riff, if you like, on Soviet propaganda, like our corn is bigger than everybody, our tomatoes are bigger than everybody, Lysenko's fabulous, you know, um, breeding the new man after you've bred the new tomato ideology, is always already absurd in Fanti, and by the time Althusser prefaces him, it's there that he writes about, uh, he uses the trope of the emperor, you know, the naked emperor, the emperor with no clothes, and all sorts of things to show his extreme unrest. Fanti also uses this series based on Mayakovsky. Um, oh, they're always Soviet, both Soviet romantic painting precursors here, but also um, other things going on. But the idea of ideology flying away in 76 really uh, is, the, the 76 is the moment, going back to the vegetables, when Althusser lets the cat out of the bag. He prefaces one of his students, Dominique Lecour, who has written a book on the Lysenko scandal in France. Lysenko is the guy who pretended you could breed men like you could, I'm just saying this very quickly, you could breed men like you could breed tomatoes. And in Artis's preface, he talks about the millions of victims, the facts which make you want to tear your eyes out, and all sorts of things, although it's hidden away in the preface. And by the time of 1978, he actually renounces the party and the ideology all evaporates, and as you know, in a hit of, fit of passion, manages to strangle his wife and then get locked up um, and not prosecuted but locked up for the rest of his life. So it's a very funny thing in which the autobiographical and the melancholic 
is part of this very strange relationship um, uh, with this quote from de Gaulle, actually, the future lasts a long time, the end of Althusser's life is very tragic. Back to Monomy, because I need to end with him quickly as I began. His work was always already very cinematic. He made other films starring these beautiful women with whom he was surrounded, like one in Brighton called Brighton Bell, with a screaming Strauss opera accompaniment. He was very interested in the relationship between photography and painting, not just in terms of a motif, but using light-sensitive canvas, so the painting almost painted itself. Uh, he used things, if you think of the alpha view um, blink of Anna Karenina, his women have got that kind of frozen Anna Karenina aspect. This is a Ukrainian woman called Adriana. And also, he was very obsessed, not so much with Alphabet, but Marcus Jeté. If you know that's based on cinematic stills, it's actually a series of stills, these film experience, but at the very end, there's a blink of an arm, which is very uncanny. And this, again, is a projection to do with the future, a kind of dystopic future, um, which is based on the present. There's a kind of time riff here. Um, then Monori and Lietar go together on a kind of road trek all over America. Lietar is chasing, paradoxically enough, the Duchamp, ex Duchamp retrospectives around America and giving lectures on them. And Monori is there too. So this is a very funny moment where Death Valley meets up with Silicon Valley, incidentally. And this kind of road trip, you almost think of it as something moving on the left. This is long before all of Baudrillard's America, incidentally. And uh, there's a sense of time zones which Lyotard writes about and can almost can't believe that the sort of intellectual center of existence in Paris, its library, the Bibliothèque Nationale, the French Revolution and everything, is like completely éclaté, burst out of, in this experience of a place where even time goes from ancient time to Pacific time. Everything is destabilized and going very quickly. Again, Monoy is pulled back to painting. You can see the relationship with Manet in these much later works, later works of the 80s. Uh, but it's all about the tech of painting. Just as Manet was using photography, Japanese prints, and lithographs to supplement the idea of the intellectual reading, he's using recording instruments and the heroine is a woman. And it actually says melancholia somewhere, as it relating to Durer instead of, instead of Manet. But there we are. And at this moment, part of their relationship, as I described in my chapter, is their discussion on film, Lyotard making films about Monori, uh, which supplement Lyotard's own filmmaking practice. He did very funny shorts. My favorite one is called Gillette Mao, which is photos of Mao posters and a Gillette razor blade advert. Um, in a kind of sink. Uh, and uh, this is with the filmmaker, David Brown, English, helping them along. And they talked about this relationship. Uh, and of course, Matt Mono is the only painter who, who, who is invited, the only actual only painter invited by Utah to have an, any presence, this disappearing has, uh, presence of a plane crash in Utah's Les Immateriaux. You can think about Warhol disappearing Marilyn here, of course, as well. But actually, in that moment, I think that was a year, if you look at Wikipedia plane crashes, an extraordinary number of plane crashes. And there's enormous new interest now in these Les Immateriaux. I'm just going to China to talk about Les Immateriaux because people think this is a really the cusp of another paradigm change which involves us now with the digital. So what is funny is that this relationship with which I began, which began, one could say, with Monoy as a little boy going to the cinema with the blue cellophane filters over old films, is ending at this moment of a paradigm change which actually anticipates the end of cinema in the new digital world in which we are, or cinema itself becoming anachronistic. And strangely enough, of course, this is what um, this is painting as well, monorail painting, but, and this is, this is the film strips themselves becoming anachronistic. The images 
becoming just like those bits of manifesto drifting over the sky in, in, Mono, in, in Mondovi's homage to Hawks, the great uh, American filmmaker. But finally, even Godard himself, he didn't say fin, he said the end of cinema. So this apprehension of, of getting to the end of media, all these media so distant from but implicated in painting, was also anticipated by Godard himself. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions you would like to ask? To Sarah? I'm very happy. Or we have questions for me. Yes. Yeah. It was quite a long lecture. We could break up. It was very, very interesting. I would like to add that if you had visited your friends, this exhibition by the Suburban artist will go the retrospect, very mm -hmm. late. Well, oh, here? Yeah, yeah because so it's not here. Right. 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 It's in this bad street, Salt. Mm -hmm. And this one artist was, uh, for the, she got a scholarship from the academy here, Bozart, Turkish mm -hmm. Bozart, and with five male artists. Mm -hmm. She went to Paris, and that was the year 1977. Mm -hmm. So she saw this uh, hyperrealism going on. Mm -hmm. at the fair, mm -hmm. so she was so absorbed by it, and she said, I need to do something that these male friends cannot do. So she started this realism, <coughs> she started this idea of capturing moments from the vitrines of mm -hmm. Istanbul when oh, she was back. Nice. So that I was thinking, I'm actually writing a critic about this uh, retrospect, because I always wrote that she uh, she needed to have a uh, retrospective before, right? Because mm -hmm. her contemporaries had many until now. But now, now that we are facing these uh, paintings of her, dated 1973, 74, 77, we see the impact of the Paris realism on her. Mm -hmm. But she uh, she erased this uh, effect that the male artists did showing themselves in front of the vitrine. Mm -hmm. Not, but she was erasing all the, the presents of the looker, you know? And mm -hmm. but when she's transforming the uh, vitrine uh, as it is, so she's creating a body, uh, a new body. You know, I'm just, mm -hmm. uh, you made me now to make these uh, oh, so differences, mm -hmm. yes. So thank you very much. And I would also like to add something more about our local uh, you know, uh, you like local modernity. So this, uh, the Labour Party, the uh, Communist Party, Labour Party of Istanbul, of Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, they, the members were very much interested in Godard cinema. Mm -hmm. And then uh, this critic that we lost, because he was a friend of my father's, Olan Kutlar, actually uh, opened the Cinematek just to be able to make uh, his contemporaries, his intellectual writing friends, to be able to see more Godard movies, you know? Yeah. And it was almost just the uh, 1960s. So we have this parallel, you know? Mm -hmm. And when Paris was watching Godard, here the communists were watching Godard. Yeah. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I, in the and we see them had film clubs that showed Soviet films. Yes, because the French obviously were showing Soviet films, and as you yeah. know, there were these groups called things like Diga, Diga, Diga Vertov groups. Yes. So there was a, yeah. a relationship between also both Soviet film techniques mm -hmm. and, and, and the contemporary cinema. But this whole thing, there's so much more that needs to be done. It's not just local modernity. These things really irritate me. It's actually a much, much more fluid relationship, mm -hmm. almost instantaneous yes. absorption of the same influence. Mm -hmm. and the same thoughts and the same intellectual ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, nationalistic art is new, but nonetheless nationalistic art histories that like even masochistic terms like local modernity are not up to speed. They're not up to speed. Intellectuals at the time who were involved, what they were reading and yes. what they were looking at. Yes. What was translated yeah. makes a lot of change. Prat is also a deep mm -hmm. 30s, uh, you are studying right now, right? Yeah. 1930s Sovietic yeah. influence mm -hmm. on uh, mm -hmm. Turkish artists and the yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Some of their actors and actresses and some painters went to the Moscow around uh, during the 1925, 27. Mm -hmm. So, lastly, uh, 
first discovered a short uh, film by uh, uh, Dino. Yes. And the now showed, it's showing, I think, in outside the festival now. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh. It's, it's so great. And of course, one more addition I would like to add because you have students here. Uh, this uh, Yuxe Asna, when they started to reread uh, Marx, uh -huh. something about that because I please do because I haven't got round to it yet. Yes. It's really, really interesting. I can add something also. Okay. So, so first of all, uh, thank you so, uh, for your lecture. And then it's a little bit it seems to me that also another consonance with that period is fluxus moment. So for instance the uh, uh, blink of an eye yeah. was another video shot by Yokohono uh, during the nineteen sixties. Yeah, yeah, so that's the, you know that the fluxus movement is also is associated with the materialism. Uh, so because of the George Machunas, so George Machunas is on the left side of the... And now <laughs> we are in the museum of uh, fluxus museum, we are the Archer's uh, collection. is based on um, iconic, but very small scale, iconic fluxus works. So that's why the... Oh, the yeah, I didn't know that because we just arrived. <laughs> Thank you all very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you.